So now that we finished discussing the design constraints, let's go into the actual timing reports that come out of it and are used both for optimization and for us to check uh, our design. Okay, so we'll start discussing check types. First of all, throughout the lecture, we've discussed the two primary timing checks, setups or max delay and hold or min delay. However, in practice, there are um, a few other categories that you will encounter, recovery, removal, clock gating, minimum pulse width, and data to data, and we'll very, very briefly discuss these on the next slide. So starting with recovery, removal, and minimum pulse width checks. The recovery and removal checks are both for asynchronous reset signals, set or reset signals. So recovery is defined as the minimum time that an asynchronous signal input pin must be stable after being deasserted and before the next clock transition. So in other words, you can see here, this is a reset signal, a low reset signal that's deasserted here. So we came out of reset and um, this is the amount of time for recovery that we have to be um, uh, clear before we rise, raise the clock. A removal check is the minimum time the NASA chrono signal input pin must be stable before being deasserted and after the previous clock transition. So here's the previous clock transition, and here's how long we should wait until we deassert this reset. So these are two checks that are often uh, that are checked by the timing engines. Um, we usually don't run into problems with them, um, so we don't discuss them as much as the max and min delays. Finally, we have the minimum pulse width or the MPW check, which is also defined inside our lib files. There's an MPW table, and it's the amount of time after the rising falling edge of a clock that the clock signal must remain stable. So it's actually discussing how long the clock signal has to, to be um, if it gets ruined by transitions and so forth. So that should not happen. We'll have to buffer or fix that transition in some other way. The category of clock gating is uh, more common, you'll see it often, and a uh, clock gating check happens anywhere where we have anything that gates the clock. Gating the clock is something that blocks the clock, and if we have, for example, an AND uh, gate on the clock, um, if there's an enable signal here that's going to be pulled down, and if this is the clock going through, we're, we're going to have a gate. It's not going to show up. The output's going to be zero. So this is considered a clock gate, uh, as we kind of discussed um, in the previous lecture, but uh, any uh, basically any logic on the clock that's not an inverter or a buffer is going to gate the clock at some sort of uh, uh, condition. So we have to do a clock gating check that ensures that the arrival of a signal here um, will be in time, that it won't cause some sort of a glitch on the clock. So that's what a clock gating check is. And we have uh, here two, two examples, one where um, we have the rising edge of the clock over here, and we have to have some sort of a check that the, the clock gate signal arrives before this, and it, it, uh, it is stable at least a certain amount of time before it goes down, and a similar example on the falling edge of the clock to the rising edge of the clock. So these are clock gating checks, and they will appear, and you will see that there are races between this kind of enable signal and the clock signal, and they have to often be fixed. Okay, so those are all the categories of basic timing checks that are run in our design, and now we'll start going to the actual report. So we want to check our design. One of the first things to do is run this report analysis coverage um, command, which shows us basically all of the types of checks that were done, set up and um, uh, clock gating and uh, pulse width recovery and so forth, the things that I talked about. It shows you how many of these types of paths were checked, how many of them were met and versus how many were violated and what number were untested and we should uh, try to understand these types of things see if it fits what we expected and see why things were untested or violated we can use the check timing command to perform a variety of consistency and completeness checks on the timing constraints for a specific design we should really check if there are unconstrained paths if we understand what they all are and why uh, that can often um, point us to something that is that some sort of flip-flop that doesn't get a clock and then it's not checked at all. The most important command probably that we have in all of our tools is the report timing command. I'm going to use the stylus common UI syntax that is now used by both Genus, uh, Innovus, and Tempest, but um, it's similar types of reports will be shown for tools such as uh, Design Compiler, ICC, and so forth. 
Okay, so uh, what we have is we have like an arrival time of the data and the required time and we have the setup and hold and, and different types of things that we discussed and we're going to be looking at these types of timing reports but in a whole like list of type of a thing. Okay, so when we uh, type report timing, we're going to get this long, long thing. You see the, these three dots mean that this was a very, very, very long type of a list here. And um, uh, it has two parts. One part is the header, and the second part is the launch path. That's the default of what at least Inovis is going to be usually showing when we write report timing. So I'm going to zoom in on the header, which shows us basically all of the data we need to know about our design. Okay, so this is really a, a, a verbose type of a, a, slide, a set of slides that's going to show you different parts and how you can extract different information from your timing report. So what we have here is we'll have the path number. That means uh, that's usually ordered in terms of worst negative slack. So remember in our STA algorithm, we actually got the worst path first, and then we could find what the second worst path and third worst path by removing them and heapifying. So that's what we'll get here. This is the worst path that we asked for, or the worst path. And it says violated. That means if we have negative or positive slack, violated is negative slack, met is positive slack. And then it actually shows us the slack, which is 0.03 nanoseconds. So we have here um, three picoseconds of negative slack, and we uh, uh, we can see here that it says it's a setup check with pin, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we know that this is a setup check and not a hold check. There are other things here that we'll uh, go into. So the path group, this is a reg to reg path. Remember, we defined our different types of path groups. We have the start point. The start point here is this long um, type of a thing um, with uh, at the clock pin of this flip-flop. Remember, start points are usually the clock pins of flip-flops. The end point is this long name here, the D pin of the next flip-flop. And you can tell that these are both flip-flops because the synthesizer added the underscore reg notation after them. Um, in addition, these R's or F mean that these are rising or falling edges. Now, pay attention that the clock and this shows which clock it's between, will always be a rising edge because, as I said, we're assuming and we're most of the time using only positive edge-triggered flip-flops. But the data path itself can be either rising or falling. Then we have this uh, area here which discusses our, um, uh, our, uh, our clock edges, source latency, uh, and so forth. It, it, it's telling about our um, clock paths to the, both the capture and the launch. Uh, paths. So the capture path, which for some reason comes on the left side here, shows what uh, when the clock edge arrives. So that's basically zero plus big T. So we defined an SDC constraint of uh, six nanoseconds here. And so the capture path arrives at a setup check one, uh, one period, a clock period after the launch path. So it's six, where, whereas the launch path comes out at the original edge, which is time zero. The source latency and the, and the net latency and so forth, these are discussing um, parts that we'll get into more uh, better in clock tree synthesis, but it's showing the actual length of the propagation of the clock. And uh, this is when the clock actually arrives at the flip-flop. So this one arrives at, uh, uh, at a delay of 20 picoseconds, and this one arrives at a delay of 19 picoseconds. Then we'll look at the different points of the design. So setup is the uh, flip-flop setup time, and that's going to be 90 picoseconds here. Um, it's going to have uncertainty that we defined with set clock uncertainty to define like the jitter of the design. Um, CPPR we will discuss briefly later on, and the required time is actually the arrival time minus the setup minus the jitter. So our required arrival time, kind of like our rat at the end point, is 5.806 nanoseconds. Um, the launch clock we saw over here had a uh, 19 picosecond delay, and the data path delay uh, was uh, 5.79 uh, pico uh, nanoseconds. That's the uh, arrival time. So this plus this uh, arrives at our general arrival time, and the final clock, uh, clock calculation can be the required time minus the data path plus the, the launch clock path, and it gives us our final slack of uh, three picoseconds. Now that may have seemed confusing. That's the way the cadence decided to show the uh, this um, type of a path, but it, it just is trying to tell you that if you understand all of what uh, this is saying, you can find out a lot of data about this certain path. 
Now we'll go and look uh, down below at the actual launch path. And uh, again, the standard timing report, when we just write report timing, will show just this launch path. So the launch path starts at the start point, which as we can see here is uh, the, the clock pin of the flip-flop and shows a lot of stuff on this type of a uh, slide. On, uh, uh, so we have the fan out of this, um, uh, of this clock uh, pin over here. It had a 13 uh, flip-flops it saw. It, it was a rising edge over here on uh, that it was uh, driven by this uh, pin. Okay, the instance name here that, um, that, that, that drove this pin or the pin name is over here, right? The timing arc, for instance, on this, um, on this type of a cell, it went from an A to a Y arc from pin A at the input to pin Y at the output. Um, what time each of these, uh, uh, what, what the arrival time, the at actually at each one of these output pins was and what the transition on the net was. Here it was 105 picoseconds. Um, we can also have the, the delay over here was what the gate plus wire delay was between uh, this time and this time. So there's a lot of data that's written here in the, in the timing report and we'll see how we can customize that as well. Um, what we didn't see here is we didn't see all this data about the capture and launch uh, clock path. So I often uh, prefer to use report timing minus path type full clock. And that shows me both the propagation of the clock to the uh, launch flip-flop and to the capture flip-flop. So when we do that, you just have to pay attention that some of the timing uh, has changed a bit because of the way that Cadence uh, likes to show this. So right now what we can see here is we have now the launch clock um, at the bottom, uh, uh, it was added uh, uh, to the, this uh, launch path um, uh, report. And we also have this uh, source latency and the actual starting point now is this negative number, which we, will, we can explain later. Okay, but what we see here is that the start point of the, of the path now is at the actual clock port and not at the clock pin of the flip-flop. We only reach the clock pin of the flip-flop way down here. Okay, so this is the start point of the path that we had before, or it's the Q pin of the start point because we're not showing nets in this in this uh, example. Okay, and when we continue down, we um, get to see that this is the same uh, um, endpoint that we saw before. This is the endpoint of the the launch path, and then we get to the other end path. This is the capture path. So now at the capture path, we can see that we have. Um, the same clock port. It also starts at this clock underscore i input, and it ends at the the endpoint uh, the endpoint uh, uh, flip flop. But it's clock port. So uh, if we would have looked at the header again, this is where it ended, and we can see uh, the whole propagation through the capture path. So it's often uh, better, or I think it's better to look at this whole. Um, timing report that includes everything that the clock propagates through once we have finished clock three synthesis. Now, as I said, we can customize the uh, defaults that are shown here because we may not like them. And in fact, I don't um, particularly like exactly how it's shown and I have a different example here. So we can d uh, ask for different things to be added and in Inovus uh, with common UI, we use this minus fields option to get what we need. So we can write report timing minus fields and add this long thing that will show us the actual names of the columns out of a, a long list of options that we have. So what we can see here when we use uh, the choice that I showed here, we have the timing point. Okay, that's the actual point that we're discussing with timing. If we add the minus nets option, we'll also see the names of the nets that the, um, the design propagates through. But right now it's just showing uh, mainly the driving pins of each net. Okay, the standard cell names, and I blacked that out so we don't um, uh, release anything about the standard cell library that I'm using. Okay, the uh, timing arc from which pin input pin to which output pin uh, this uh, this propagated through, if it was a rising or falling edge. Okay, um, what the wire load was, um, what the load of this uh, net was. Okay, what the transition time was, what the delay, uh, the total delay through the cell was, and what the final arrival time was. I didn't mention here. Also, the fan out of this uh, of this driving pin. So that's kind of what I like to look at. Um, now, 
The thing is that by default, as I mentioned before, report timing shows us the, the most critical path, only one of them. It shows us the pin with the, uh, it shows us the path with the worst negative slack, but sometimes we'll want to look at other things. We want to analyze a specific path or a set of path. Uh, maybe I want to see only the paths that come from the primary inputs. So I can use these flags that we saw um, uh, briefly before when we were discussing set false path, so the minus from, minus to, minus through flags and different variants of them. Okay, so minus from is to select a start point, minus two is to select an endpoint, and minus three is to select any other pin that's inside uh, our um, data. So uh, we can also discuss if we want the rising um, propagation or falling propagation, for example, minus through rise or minus clock from. Okay, so um, report timing minus from flip flop one clock. That's a start point, so we're allowed to use it in a minus from field. Minus through fall, we only want to see falling um, uh, edges through mux1 i0. Minus two, all outputs will show us only those paths that actually adhere to that constraint. Another thing is that we have is path groups. So remember we had this in reg to reg, into reg, reg to out, and so forth. Um, we can also have paths that end at clock gates, which could be called reg to path gate, and treat them separately. If we use this command, this create basic path groups, it will actually go and create path groups for all of these different types, and then report them separately and optimize them se separately. Okay. Um, However, maybe we want to differentiate between a specific uh, group of paths for one reason or another. So we can use a, a command to do that, like the group path commands, group path minus from flip flop one clock to flip flop to D, uh, that's my path. I wanna have it displayed separately in my timing reports and, uh, and actually optimized separately. So I can do that. Um, if we wanna report the timing for that, we just do report timing minus path group my path. So that was all setup timing. What about report timing for hold? So when we just wrote report timing, it was showing us the, the max delay. But after hold, we want to see that it meets. After clock tree synthesis, we want to see the min delay. So what we'll do is we'll add the minus early flag. Report timing minus early will change our analysis view, which we'll, we'll discuss uh, in a little bit. And it will start looking at the hold paths. So um, did this work? This is the timing report we got. And uh, look, it says hold here. So this did work and we actually met hold timing that's pretty cool okay we I also mentioned that the analysis view changed to best case analysis view which is what we expected for hold as we'll discuss in a few minutes okay um, now what did we say about uh, hold timing we don't have this phase delay of a, of a period so the capture path starts at the same edge as the launch path which is what we would expect for a hold timing path instead of a setup constraint we have a hold constraint over here and instead of um, required minus arrival we get the slack as uh, arrival minus required so this is a different uh, type of a timing report and it's showing hold but it's very similar and all of the uh, components of it are similar to what we had for setup there's a very good uh, UI option in Novus that's called the debug timing tool. It now is uh, available in Genus as well with the Stylus Common UI. And what you can do is explore the timing report interactively, showing path schematics, SDC, highlighting the path in the layout. It's very convenient, um, even though us backend guys don't like to use GUIs. Well, how do you get to it? You hit timing, debug timing, and it will open uh, this timing path analyzer. You can look at the paths and uh, look at that whole timing report in a very interactive and kind of graphical way. Plus, as I said, you can do things like highlight the whole path in the layout on, uh, and so forth, uh, and even show a schematic of the path. So it can be very, very useful.